Art has been a mainstay in humanity for as long as we could conceive it. The internet has only served to amplify that to the nth degree. The artists of old could only dream of getting their pieces showcased in high-profile galleries a mere few decades ago. Now, anyone can pick up a pencil, a tablet stylus, or even a simple computer mouse and post whatever illustrated machinations that have inspired them to potentially hundreds of thousands. Quite literally in many cases. However, when I say anyone can post, I do mean anyone can post. From those whom have an hour of experience, to those whom have 10,000 under their belt. From the mentally sound, to the incredibly unhinged. Because of such a varied pool, it's not an uncommon thing to see an online artist gain huge notoriety and fall from grace, whether it be from outside forces or a struggle of inner turmoil simply being too much to handle. Most artists swing the doors of the internet open and begin their ascent upwards. However, only a lucky few manage to continue the same trajectory. Most tend to begin to hover in place or fall back downwards entirely. Today we'll be talking about one such case. A woman through her incredibly surreal animations and eccentric personality managed to gain quite a cult following. Even to this day, much of her work is, at least, remembered for its outward insanity and its rather dark undertones. This is the story of the self-proclaimed Queen of F, the former incredibly loved Felice Pistachio Girl, and the creator of the infamous cartoon canine, Alfred Alfer. This is the story of Emily Yukis. Emily, relative to the internet, is an artist of old, beginning her digital footprint on Newgrounds in 2005 with Osama Gets Low, a goofy cartoon reminiscent of the type of humor you would find at the time. This cartoon would feature the first instance of the titular canine himself. Her next cartoon would come six months later, this time starring Alfred, titled Alfred Gets Fixed. This would mark his mainstay in near all of her work moving forward. One thing you'll notice throughout Emily's early work is that it's a mixed bag of animated shit posts and cartoons that deal with some fairly dark subject matter. Her 07 through 08 releases on Newgrounds is the best example of this, starting with Jesus Christ Porn Star, a tribute to the 1970 movie Jesus Christ Superstar. One of Emily's biggest childhood influences, and one that even got her into singing. Jesus Christ, Superstar was one of my biggest influences when I was a child. A beautiful, beautiful movie. Uh, it taught me how to sing because all I would do is sing Jesus Christ Superstar all day long. Then dropping The Rise of Alpha, one of Emily's first attempts at making a structured full length cartoon. So, this is the big one, right? This was your big, like, first movie kind of movie with, like, a story and stuff. The best, I guess, this is, like, the first, like, real attempt at a full-length cartoon. Which stars Alfred getting wantingly drunk on the power of becoming a taco shop manager, exploring themes of childhood abandonment and how one's need for love and validation can spiral into dangerous dictatorial narcissism, especially if power is gained, no matter how little. It also explores the themes of isolation and loneliness, Emily herself saying the isolation segment was a direct reflection of her loneliness during her time in school. This is like... This is how this is how I was. I was an isolate. I had no friends. No, I didn't do any of this stuff. I didn't like watch people have sex, but I would have if I was a cartoon dog. And yeah, I was alone. Like those are my schoolmates. That's me. And I just shivering. Nothing there for me. And but now I got it all, man. After this, she would release Trotsky the Hippie, which was another inspired Jesus Christ Superstar short. And Lonely Doll learns a lesson, which is just kind of nonsense. The next would be the perpetual limbo of a room, which plays with the subject of finding routine, comfort, and even normalcy in an otherwise unhealthy and toxic environment, being unable to leave, and finding yourself in a perpetual loop of limbo forever hovering, forever in place. It would be the same year that Emily would release her infamous three-part series, Alfred's Playhouse. You can't really discuss Emily Yukis without discussing her series itself. There are two main interpretations for this trilogy. The first is it tackles the subject of unhealthy escapism from trauma and choosing to remain in blissful ignorance rather than accepting a harsh reality and subsequently becoming a worse version of yourself, even if you innately know it's not the right path to walk. Many saying Alfred being a likely stand-in for Emily to express those feelings and to cope with her own childhood abuse. The second being from Emily herself, taking a far more political angle to her past works. In an interview in 2016, 
saying the Playhouse was more of a criticism of global communism and cultural Marxism, along with the pity cultures that surround those ideologies. Uh, dictator Alfred shows up after Alfred spirals into a self-pity frenzy, which is what these <laughs> liberals like to do. They love pity. The, the communists love pity. And, you know, there's a scene in Alfred's Playhouse Part 2 when he's about to cut himself, and uh, he's going, Alfred needs love, boys and girls. Alfred needs love. Alfred needs pity and then it's like and then it like shows the shot and his eyes are rolling back in his head and it's like pity he starts cutting his leg up and he's like do 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 and uh it has on um, uh <laughs> stalin and lenin uh it, sh it shot it shoots to a picture of him and they're like oh, 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 oh. uh and then this globe starts jerking off and i'm like holy shit it's like the, this is like a metaphor for for the globalist communism just going into this like the, the the cutting leg the hole that he keeps digging into is a metaphor for cultural marxism although both these interpretations can be made given the flexible allegorical nature of alfred's playhouse the heavy political bends from emily seem a bit shoehorned although there are elements of the political it doesn't seem to be the main focus she even says the critique was more of a subconscious decision rather than a deliberate one i didn't fucking like this wasn't conscious to me. I didn't think communism has to do with pity. I didn't think that consciously. It, I think it was just so in, I don't know. I, a lot of what I, the, the best work that I do is often subconscious. Recently, she posted a three-part reaction to the series touching on the process of its creation, as well as describing her inspirations for the tunes. Much of the commentary seems more or less lighthearted, not really going in depth on the deeper themes. She goes on to remark that the first episode was more of a twisted parody of Pee Wee's Playhouse. And why Pee Wee's Playhouse? Is that just a childhood cartoon here? Or um, show you watched? I was like stone one day, I was watching Pee Wee's Playhouse. And uh, I was like, this is so fucking bombardistic. What if I just like did something? Except it's a bad playhouse, because like you go in. Because <laughs> like, what if someone just walked into Pee Wee's Playhouse, like a regular person, he just like abducted them into this world? Like, hey, come in! <laughs> And that does happen later. Yeah. The second, she explains it's more of a critique on pity, and her self-described pity issues. Pity, one of the worst problems facing the common man. I try to have no pity for nobody. Because that's a bad thing. You're, you're, okay. It's not good to have pity. It's a less than as a human. Party Wonderland. Where did, where did you get the idea for Cutty Box? I never cut myself. You were never a cutter? I just, I just would scra I scraped my arm a couple times into tension because it was cool and made myself bleed. But I never actually so cut did, myself. Did you know cutters then, like, growing up? No. no? Did you, I didn't did know any cutters. Cutter logic then? Because I figure I had, like, pity issues. So I feel like that I know, I know exactly what the pity yeah, funnel yeah. is that he's going down. I just never cut myself, probably because I'm too strong. The third reaction is Emily and her friend being fairly lighthearted, discussing the trilogy's timeline of creation, her music choices, and lightly touching on the deeper themes and why she chose them. Overall, the reactions don't really provide too much more insight into the infamous series, and really only serves as lighthearted, crude creator commentary. It's ultimately up to you, the viewer, on whether or not you'd consider it a deep internet cult classic from a girl expressing her feelings of trauma, as many have, political commentary and critique, or just a twisted Pee Wee's Playhouse parody with some deeper themes. Moving on to her 2008 work, it would be more or less a year of shitposting, having a great focus on Michael Keaton and Metalocalypse tributes, the most popular of all these being Walmart siblings. It wouldn't be until 2009 where Emily would post a total of 10 tunes, the most she had ever posted in one year here on Newgrounds. All but one would feature Alfred in some way, but only one would be a full-on proper animation, the Alfred's Story of Christmas short. It follows Alfred telling the story of the birth of Christ in a comedic TV comedy-esque style. The others would mostly consist of her titular shitposting, including some very graphic sex scenes involving the characters of Metalocalypse. You can find it, I'm not showing it to you. A couple months before the release of the Christmas special, Emily would make one of her first live appearances on the now defunct Scrapple TV. Someday we'll get paid for this. In their segment, Smut Cave, where she talks about her works up until that point, going over Alpha, her Michael Keaton obsession, and the Walmart siblings short. She would be a regular on Scrapple TV for a good period of time, even having her own mini show dubbed The Emily Show. During this time, she would be more focused on the party life in Philadelphia, as well as her work with Scrapple TV, only posting two animations between 2010 and 2011, but showcasing in many Smut Cave segments and posting music videos slash live action skits on The Emily Show. 
However, she would still focus on improving her art as well as diving into the medium of painting. Not only would she focus on her illustrative skills, but her musical talents as well. In Philadelphia's underground music scene, she would create the band Emily Pucus and the Vagrants. That has been going on sort of uh, in the underground music scene. Yes, uh, Philadelphia is great for that. What is this band? What's the deal? It's called Emily Pucus and the Vagrants. <laughs> The animation she would post in the two-year time frame would be another couple of shit posts. The first being a music video homage to Gigi Allen's I Wanna Fuck Myself, titled Alfred Fucks Himself. I'm sure you can guess what the type of imagery was. And the next coming in 2011, titled Alfred the Creator. Another music video where our beloved canine proceeds to have graphic intercourse with the characters from Metalocalypse over Tyler the Creator's VCR wheels. 2012 would mark a departure from the shit posts as Emily would go on to create three animated music videos. The first being animated over Odd Future's Analog 2, and the second being a short segment over Tyler the Creator's Transylvania. The third being, in my opinion, Emily's most visually grotesque work of her artistic career. And I made a music video over MC Bush Pig's Eat My Rotten Meat. She would finish off the year by voice acting in Screamer Claus's short film, Affection. Her third most productive year for Newgrounds Animation would come in 2013, releasing the first three installments of the Alfred Alpha movie. The first, Alfred's Big Surprise, and the second, Dead Girl Strip Club, being released back to back. The third installment would be released at the tail end of the same year titled, GG Alfred. Between the second and third installments, Emily would release Game Grumps and Hellbenders parodies, tying them both into the premise of the movie, as she explains, Alfred is a corrupt internet porn star who takes over the whole industry by raping other people's characters in a slew of pandering bullshit. This mess of a parody pandering travesty is the manifestation of Dictator Pickles, if you will, as Alfred plugs himself into the computer and corrupts through the pixel world as he gains cash and views. 2014 would mark a bit of a come up for Emily's animation career as she would join the Artists and Animators Association, otherwise known as the Asshole Animators Association Online, presumably around 2014. She'd start the year off by releasing the Alfred's Poron Loop 2014, it's exactly how it sounds, followed by my personal favorite work of hers, Boomerang, an animated music video over Armand Pactel's track of the same name. She would go on to release three other AMV loops, the Alfred Alpha movie trailer, a parody of American Psycho, American Alpha, and voice act in Spadaru's, formerly Speedo Sausage, Skate or Die. 2015 would bring with it one of the last installments of the Alfred Alpha movie, titled Return to the Playhouse. She would collaborate with Mr. Chanbers in his project Tinder IRL and released an AMV, Schoolgirl Alpha, I Remember You. She would also collaborate with Troma Entertainment after the company's founder, Lloyd Kaufman, had discovered her work at Newgrounds' Pico Day, specifically showcasing Gigi Alpha to the company founder. For those who don't know, Pico Day is the annual yearly party for Newgrounds.com. So, Lloyd Kaufman was there because he actually was a a producer of Newgrounds back in the day, back in like 2001 or some shit when Newgrounds was kind of like faltering, you know, so he, he kicked them back up and uh, I was like, Mr. Kaufman, do you have time for a quick cartoon? Because he was about to leave and he was like, well, sure! And so we brought him into the, the projector room and uh, I played Gigi Alfred upon the thing. So he took to me right away and he was like, I'm like, we're gonna meet up you're gonna do trauma dance, you're gonna be a star. And I was like, oh boy, Mr. Kaufman, whatever you say. Cause you know, always got your doubts. But when, when Lloyd Kaufman's saying you're great, then what you, what, what you have to counter that, right? And uh, still in a state of disbelief about the whole thing. 2015 would also mark her last appearance on Scrapple TV. The first being her final interview on Smut Cave and the final time with her and the Spelunker singing a duo cover of Captain and Tanel's Love Will Keep Us Together. Oh, keep us together. We'll never, Twenty sixteen would mark the most controversial turning point for Yukis. 
as she would leave the realm of internet animation and begin to dive into the world of politics. She would also release the final installment of the Alfred Alpha movie, titled The Ascent of Alfred. Before we go into Emily's spicy semi-recent history, I want to put together a timeline as well as a plot synopsis of the infamous film, as it can be confusing. Emily's plan from the get-go was to release the movie in parts, all of which can be found on her Newgrounds account between her other works. One thing you'll notice about the movie is that it doesn't do any proper character establishment. It just kind of throws you in. In order to understand who the characters are and what they're doing, you have to go back in Emily's body of work and even slightly outside of it, starting with The Rise of Alpha, showing him to have multiple personality disorder brought on by being heavily neglected. This makes him crave attention, love, and validation to an unhealthy degree. So much so, he becomes a dictator, even at the grasp of very minor power. The perpetual limbo of a room, along with Alfred's Playhouse 1 and 2, served to further establish the character, along with the Playhouse setting. In Part 3, we're formally introduced to Dictator Pickles, Alfred's alter ego, and the main antagonist. The formal start of the movie would begin a little under six years later, when Alfred's big surprise is released, featuring Alfred and a dark shadowy dog character by the name of Labby. Originally, I thought this character was a redesign of the shadowy figure in Alfred's Playhouse Part 2, which seems half true. He's actually a pre-existing character from Where the Dead Go to Die, created by Jimmy Screamer Claws. And interestingly enough, the Alfred Alpha movie seems to take place in the same universe. We follow both characters for about a minute and a half before Labby abandons Alfred in The Land of the Exiled Dead. He trudges through the lands and comes across a drunken grow melon, I guess. Along with giving Alfred bad advice by drinking to cure his broken heart, he drones on about sucking dick and urinary tract infections. It ends with Alfred being fooled by a mirage of Labby and a shot of Dictator Pickles decrying the disheveled canine. Our next installment would come three months later with Dead Girl Strip Club, where we see Alfred taking the advice of the melon amalgamation and begin to drink its sorrows away. However, the heartbreak becomes too much to bear as Labby's afterimage shows up and encourages Alfred to take his own life. As he's about to do just that, he gets distracted by the appearance of the dead girls. We would soon find out that this was all just a horrific fever dream. Alfred finding himself in a graveyard surrounded by defiled corpses and a newfound propensity for necrophilia, ending off with Dictator Pickles taking over. The next installment would come seven months later, titled GG Alfred, Alfred continuing to explore his newfound necrophiliac fantasies. The installment would double as a music video for GG Allen's I Fuck the Dead, sung by Emily's band, Emily Pucus and the Vagrants, ending with Alfred returning to the Playhouse. A year and three months later, we'd get our next installment, Return to the Playhouse, where Alfred would be met with the abuse and torture at the hands of many familiar faces. The final installment would come in October of 2016, where Alfred would leave his reality behind and essentially upload himself to the internet, destroying the playhouse and himself in the process. After over three years, this would conclude the Alfred Alpha movie. But if you count from the release of The Rise of Alpha, then it would be a little over a decade in the making. You wouldn't be alone in thinking the movie is scattered, both literally and figuratively in its storytelling. The most glaring contention point for me at least, is that there's really no proper introduction. It just drops you into the setting with very little to work with. The movie heavily relies on the viewer being aware of prior Alfred lore. A new viewer only discovering and watching the movie wouldn't have any idea who Alfred is, let alone who the other characters are. For instance, what is slash who is Labby? A separate entity or another extension from Alfred's mind? From there, other questions arise like, why is Alfred and Labby on a road trip? Did Labby trick him somehow only to abandon him in the land of the exiled dead? But why? Just to torment him? What is the drunken gore melon? Is it just a reference to Alfred molesting a watermelon in the Rise of Alfred? What is the land of the exiled dead? Was it an actual place or a fever dream from Alfred? Was half this movie just a dream? A disassociative delusion? Taking place as Alfred was molesting corpses in a graveyard? I guess you can say that it is, given the prior context from the Rise of Alfred and the Playhouse trilogy. However, on its own, the movie requires a heavy amount of guessing and interpretation to understand what's going on without hindsight. Although the movie on its own feels discombobulated, I think it should be treated as more of a trip rather than a conventional movie experience. An artifact stemming from an internet of old, and a testament to the improvement of technical artistic skill from an unconventional and unwell mind. Alfred's story may have ended in 2016, but Emily's certainly didn't, as she would find herself embroiled in controversy. Starting with the more lighthearted stuff, she crashed an animation panel at MAGFest in early 2016. 
It featured Jaxi, I think Tomar's wife, a couple of animators from Studio Yoda, Rice Pirate Mick, Oni and G, Topspin Fuzzy, and Bibsy Pop, the creator of Hasbin Hotel. The panel was a shit show from the beginning. What are your thoughts and advices on making a art business that is majority is porn rather than uh, regular stuff? Corey, come here, talk about porn. My special boy, Corey. Here he comes. Bruh. Oh, okay. Want to play by play? Corey. Harry Potter. <laughs> <laughs> you drugs. <laughs> What was the question? Yeah. Emily just added to it. Woo! Woo! Trigger, trigger's the best. Trigger's good. Yeah. Sexy, trigger. smart, and uh, alt right. <laughs> <laughs> it would be later that same year where Emily's politics would be put at the forefront of the eyes of the public, driving headlong into political punditry, more specifically for the white nationalist, neo Nazi, and alt right movements at the time. Of course, just like her career in animation, her online presence was just as insane. From her retweets of David Duke to talking about the high IQ Ubermensch. The most well known happening in Yukis' political career would be her appearance at the NPI, or National Policy Institute, convention in 2016, a white nationalist think tank and lobbying group based in Arlington, Virginia, headed by Richard Spencer, a notorious white nationalist. Emily and her cameraman would confront the protesters outside of the convention, and it would go about as well as you'd expect. This footage would make its way around the internet, along with Emily's other posts and would ultimately culminate in her termination of work as the Pistachio Girl, a position she held for over six years up until that point. For a time, she would find herself homeless in the ghettos of Philadelphia, and much of the friendships made and the bridges constructed in her time there were severed and destroyed because of this. She had also become a sizable target on the local Antifa's radar. As a result, she would end up moving to South Korea in order to escape the harassment, among other reasons. Why South Korea? Well, Emily being an avid frequenter of 4chan's poll, she had read that those on the board had recommended the country, as her criteria was it being relatively safe and not overrun by nogs and mud slimes. She also had a great fear of an impending adoption of Sharia law in the West. Her stay in South Korea is where this gem was born. Guys, guess what? I have a secret to tell you. I have a confession. But it seems, I think you'll be able to figure it out. And it'll make sense when you hear my confession. Well, guys, I'm a Hapa. I'm half Asian. <laughs> oh my god, I totally look Korean. Look at all, look at all, so. Look at all, look at all. Her political activism would only get wackier as time went on, along with the people she associated with, her politics seeping into nearly all of her projects. Animation-wise, it would mostly consist of commissioned work and a handful of shit posts. the first being an animated teaser for the band Twisted in 2017, meant to advertise their album The Continuous Evolution of Life's Questions. The second was a project titled Waking Up, an 8-minute animation commissioned anonymously in 2018. Her other work consisted of live-action music videos and skits such as Dictator Yukis, where she would call upon her fans to create fan art in 2016, the same year she would release Wizard of Paws, a music video satirizing multiculturalism, O White's Divine, a rather spicy music video, and a handful of shit posts. She would continue to frequent political rallies, such as the DNC convention in Philadelphia in 2016. Along with being interviewed by right-wing and far-right political organizations, such as Red Ice, I believe she even collaborated with them during the infamous MPI protest, being interviewed on David Duke's show, and appearing on Gavin McInnish's show twice. The second time is where she would try to bait him into saying the 14 words. Okay, well, besides adoption, do you think that whites should be breeding and breeding with other whites and perpetuating the white race? Of course! I so you believe in the 14 words? Read those 14 words. Say it, say it, Gavin. And you will prove, you will prove that you're really at the crux of this movement. Okay, let's do it, Emily. Uh, we? I don't know the 14 words. I just know that every time I hear the number 14, I'm suspicious. Oh, well, don't, because this is, there is nothing wrong with these words. These are perfectly harmless words. Let's say it together, okay? Okay. We, we must secure. We, we, we must secure. The existence of our people. The existence of our people. And a future for white children and a future for Western children. 
white because you don't do you want to replace Europe with you're saying you want to replace it with other races as long as they adhere to Western chauvinist ideals. That's totally cool, right? Sure. Yes. What? So you want America to be a uh, um, white people to be a minority in America? I don't think that's an issue if we focus on Western chauvinism. We have to deal with the hand we're dealt. But I... you just said the 14 words, Gavin. You just said it. It wasn't that hard. Oy vey. All right. Thanks for coming on the show, Oy Emily. Vey! Interestingly enough, Emily's final descent into full fascism, as she puts it, wasn't too long before her second Gavin McInnes interview, where before she was more alt-light, although still being heavily swayed by race-based politics, aligning herself with the likes of Lauren Southern, Milo Yiannopoulos, and the aforementioned Gavin McInnes, saying she thought they were the epicenter of the alt-right movement. After discovering Red Ice, she would find the right stuff, a white nationalist and neo-Nazi forum and podcast host, and not much longer after that, she would find herself on the Stormfront forums, finally finding, as she puts it, the center of the movement. I uh, found TRS, TRS Radio. I got on the Discord first, because I went to Discord, and I started out on the R the Donald Discord, and then I went to the Poll Discord, and two weeks I was on the Stormfront one. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I was like, oh, I found it. I found the center. Here it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and um, so I was on the TRS Discord for a while, really nice guys, and then they sent me up with a forum account, and... Uh, I started reading the Daily Stormer, and I think that's when I made the final leap. And by that point, I knew Gavin was going to have me on again, and I knew that when he did, I could, you know, I could have just shilled my cartoon, kissed his ass, avoided the the real thing. But I was like, no, I know what I must do. From then onward, Emily would continue her career in far right, white nationalist, and neo-Nazi online political punditry, even to this day. From 2016 to 2020, she would continue to appear on shows like Red Ice, Patriotic Weekly, Fascism Now, The White Art Collective, and even making an appearance on Shia LaBeouf's infamous He Will Not Divide Us livestream. What? Who are you? Who are you? White power! White power! She would also be interviewed on Jean Francois Garippi's show, The Public Space, a couple of times even being a likely candidate as his co-host. Funny enough, the two would get involved in some drama. The first instance was Jean accusing Emily of copyright infringement after she had reposted the live stream that she had appeared on from someone else. The second would be Jean overly policing Emily's language in her second appearance in order to stay within YouTube's TOS. She would subsequently show up on the Ralph Retort's kill stream discussing it. During this time, she would continue to post crude music videos along with creating a parody of RT's Kaiser Report. Emily's associations are pretty much what you'd expect from then on. But before we go into our more recent history, I'd like to discuss a man that she had been associated with back in 2018. A man by the name of Patrick Little. I won't go too deep, as it's outside the purview of this video. Not only that, but exploring his rabbit hole has opened up a proverbial trench regarding the whole scene she's involved in. To me, it all screams of conmen, honeypots, and psyops and really just serves as a good reminder to stay away from the brain rot that is political extremism, both on the right and the left. Somewhere around 2017 or 2018, Yukis would get involved with the aforementioned Patrick Little, a former U.S. Senate candidate who ran in California in 2018. His campaign was, unsurprisingly, unsuccessful, as much of his campaign consisted of antagonizing the Jewish, Emily joining him in this endeavor. The most infamous stunt the duo pulled was trying to fly a blimp with the caption Jews Rape Kids over the San Francisco baseball stadium during the Jewish Heritage Night game. This, just like Little's campaign, was also unsuccessful. They would later post a video going over this escapade. This is where we get a bit conspiratorial. There are a good amount of oddities surrounding the man. These oddities could suggest a couple of things. I'm going to use Occam's razor here and just say he may be a fairly stupid ideologue. However, you may think otherwise. The first point of note is this image macro, where it showcased an excerpt from Little's website, calling upon those who had voted for him to fight against election rigging. He wanted you to fill out a form stating the precise precinct or location where you had voted for him, with the option of certifying an affidavit, supposedly for the purpose of challenging the election results. It would be one month later where he was detained by Canadian Border Patrol for three to four hours. During that time, they would discover his binder full of voter correspondence and other types of letters. The Canadian authorities would spend this time going through everything the man had on him, including intensely questioning him regarding his whereabouts, along with anyone he may or may not have interacted with before his attempted entry into Canada. 
just got detained at the Canadian border for about three or four hours. Uh, first thing, they asked for IDs. They went in, processed our IDs, then they came out and asked me if I had a YouTube channel. And so I said that and asked me what I did. I said I was an entertainer and a politician. They proceeded to have us get out of the car and wait for a while on a bench. We have to wait up. And they, they searched through the car with a fine tooth comb, and I had a an accordion like a uh, binder that folds out and expands uh, with all of the mails that, that were flyers that I hadn't had time to read yet. So I got a lot of uh, mail for my campaign and I, they found that binder and you know, I keep everything. Uh, in case somebody sends me something and then they like stop me and do something crazy, I've got, I keep all the mail I get, so. But before, you know, before they gave me this verdict on whether or not I get to enter Canada, which they did not let me do, they asked me, where I was staying, who I was with, okay, I had stayed in a town here in the border before that, what was the person's name, they wanted to know the name of every person that I had had anything to do with while I was in that town. Uh, they asked me, I said, I went for a walk, they're like, did you run into anyone on that walk? You know, uh, so it was pretty crazy, uh, they asked all sorts of crazy questions. Um, Even though this image macro assumes the worst, it's worth noting the mail he had on him was supposedly physical mail he had received during his campaign. What ultimately got him rejected from entry into Canada was his possession of a particularly spicy piece of unhinged mail. Included in this folder were the pamphlets and stuff that people had sent me. Like one of them was a little bit spicy for my tastes uh, regarding a race I normally don't have problems with. And I kept it just in case this person wound up, you know, getting a little overly familiar without my permission. And anyhow, uh, so they found this one that was a little super spicy, and uh, they're like, uh, yeah, this is hate propaganda. You can't bring this into Canada. We could arrest you right now. This is an arrestable offense, but, you know, we're just going to turn you away from the border. And Whether or not Little had physical copies of any of the forms that may have been filled out on his website is unknown. One thing that is safe to assume, however, is anyone that had sent him mail that was found at the border is definitely on a list. It doesn't end there, unfortunately. There exists a document compiling a great deal more information regarding the man, titled A Little Investigation. And just as a disclaimer, the doc has a heavy anti-Semitic bias, which takes away a lot of the potential credence the piece could have otherwise had, in my opinion. That being said, some of the information compiled still stands on its own. First off, prior to his abysmal political campaign, he worked as a United States Marine, specifically in IT, and a fairly experienced one at that. He also ran Little Hunter Enterprises, the parent company of a small-time wireless network company, Blitz Wireless, of which he was also the CEO. So the first question arises, why would he leave a well-off IT job and career prospects to pursue this? The second anomaly is his employment at Vets for Trump. He was one of two employees, the second being a woman by the name of Nicole Garay, a Jewish woman, on its own not really something of note, but given the context, You'd think someone who is self-admittedly anti-Jewish wouldn't be working with someone of Jewish descent, especially seemingly during his campaign. The next big discrepancy is when people started poking around, he removed Vets for Trump from his experience section on his resume, and Vets for Trump removed him from their list of employees. It is worth pointing out his removal from the site only seems to exist in this screen cap on the dock itself, and no archives of the instance seem to exist. The site itself is also gone. The next odd discrepancy is his robocall escapade, where he launched a great deal of automated calls to potential voters to get his name out there. America has a Jewish problem. To the people of Sandpoint, Bonner County, in North Idaho, my name is Patrick Little, and I'll be arriving shortly. Well, the man in that robocall is Patrick Little, a neo-Nazi who is running for U.S. Senate in California, who also says he's running for president in 2020. Little is now setting his sights on Sandpoint, Idaho, leaving voicemails for dozens throughout the city there. It was found that a company called The Road to Power sponsored this endeavor. The man who ran this company was Scott D. Rhodes, otherwise known as Scott Playtech. He was another rather insane neo-Nazi who had allegedly been caught terrorizing the community in which he lived with tons of far-right propaganda. In the article that was written about him, it points out his status as a registered agent for a company called American Discovery Publishing. A company claiming to specialize in consumer research. When the listed phone number was called, an answering machine picked up, but no message was returned. 
Ben Olson, the publisher and reporter for the Standpoint Reader, had tried to discern who Road slash Playtech may have been connected to, even saying he's being instructed to do that by somebody, it seems. Olson believing his connections lying with sizable racist organizations, while the author of the Little Investigation doc believes he was connected to an intelligence cell. There are two other parts to this expose with some more strange anomalies, namely his campaign manager being employed as a field organizer at Next Gen Climate, one of the most well-funded climate change oriented super PACs founded by billionaire Democrat Tom Steyer. The same organizer also worked for another insane candidate running for senator in Florida, Augustus Invictus, whom sacrificed a goat and drank its blood. We're really getting off in the weeds here, good god. Point is, there's some odd associations and connections that could suggest Little is, at least, a crazy grifter, and at worst, associated with a honeypot. Whether or not Emily knew about this is unknown. Alright, back to Emily. It wouldn't be too much longer after her involvement with Little when Emily would appear on Red Ice and announce her engagement, and get married the next year on April 20th, 2019. At first it was speculated as to who her husband was, some even thinking it was Little himself, but it was later found that she had married Warren Baylog, a contributing figure within TRS, or The Right Stuff. He was part of the founding council of the National Justice Party. Founded in 2020, it was a far-right and neo-Nazi political party with a focus on white civil rights. It would be a little under three years later when the party would dissolve due to heavy amounts of infighting. From 2020 to the present, Emily would continue to post and make guest appearances on far-right political talk shows such as Patriotic Weekly and the White R Collective, along with posting content including three music videos the same year, the most popular being be early the next year where she would debut her political podcast, Modern Politics, on Odyssey, co-hosted with her husband, the aforementioned Warren Baylog. The podcast, along with her personal Odyssey channel, is where she seems to be the most active. Her two most recent works being a 39-minute sketch of the Kaiser Report and Skibbity Tunnel. Emily came into the internet a troubled young woman. Through the abuse and neglect of her upbringing, she sought to express those emotions brewing within her mind. As a result, she managed to create a fairly well-regarded underground internet cult classic an incredibly intelligent and thoughtful piece on the dangers of willingly accepting blissful ignorance instead of facing a harmful reality. Through this, she was able to improve and make some fairly solid friends and connections over the years. However, her propensity for edginess and contrarianism clashed with her need for love and acceptance, and caused many of the bridges she had built to be burned down. The Alfred's Playhouse trilogy being a fairly grim foretelling of this future, at least to some degree. As with those bridges burnt, new ones would be built, some leading to a life of stability and family, all others wouldn't lead to the most sane of places. My name is Chicken Broth, and until next time, get out. <laughs>